And welcome to this week's episode of Making It in Asheville, your podcast for hearing stories of entrepreneurs, creators, makers in Asheville. We sit down, ask them what they are making and how they are making it in Asheville. And this week we are joined by Eric Sheffer, the restaurateur you might know from Vinny's on Merriment, uh, or most recently from Jetty Ray's on Charlotte Street, right down the street from our first apartment in Asheville. Uh, and so, Eric, there are so many things that we can ask. What I'll just say is, how do you introduce yourself uh, when you meet people today? <laughs> I generally introduce myself as uh, Eric Sheffer, and um, when people ask me what I do, I tell them that uh, I've, uh, for the last uh, 22 years in Asheville, I've been in uh, comestibles. <laughs> Got it. F- firefighting, I imagine, as well. Yes. Uh, problem solving yes. and, and no breaks. It, exactly. I, uh, I I sleep very much and uh, I try to keep my toes in uh, a lot of different uh, puddles around here in Nashville. Got it. So uh, this is a podcast, but we also have the YouTube channel. I see in the room that you are in. Is that Vinny's? Uh, yes, this is the back room of Vinny's. It's called our Goomba room. So it's uh, <laughs> a little bit more intimate, uh, generally where we take um, our staff when we have to have a serious conversation and sometimes people leave and sometimes they don't. Got it. <laughs> oh, good. This is very, uh, I feel like we're uh, talking about a Godfather's uh, s- <laughs> sequel, the, the third, the fourth. Um, I love it. So there are, uh, I, I, I can't overlook that we, you and I at least come from the Northeast. I, I grew up in New Jersey. Sarah, my wife, uh, partner in crime on making it in Asheville. Uh, and I most recently moved here from Brooklyn. Ah. Were you in Brooklyn before Asheville 20 something years ago, or was there somewhere between the two? There was a lot between the two. I, uh, I was born okay. in Brooklyn and, uh, my, when my dad hit it big, we moved out to uh, Huntington, Long Island, where I finished junior high school and high school. Um, and then I left right out of high school and I went to California and I was in Los Angeles for the better part of 19 years in a completely different career than I'm in right now. Got it. So uh, I, I want to hear a little bit about that, but I also want to just kind of set set a baseline in case somehow people haven't heard about your restaurants. Talk to me a little bit about. Uh, I believe there are two, it, it, Vinny's and, and Jetty Ray's. Is there are there other restaurants in the uh, restaurant group today? What's happening today? Sure. Um, well, it wouldn't it wouldn't be uh, complete unless I gave you a little bit. So I. I uh, the restaurant that made me most uh, well known here in Asheville was a restaurant called the Savoy, which I had for twelve years. And wow, I'm sorry, eleven years. And that was a uh, Asheville's premier fine dining restaurant. It was incredibly um, well lauded by uh, Food and Wine and Wine Spectator, and we got a lot of amazing press. And it was uh, it was a great ride. And so right after uh, I I closed that, I um, decided to open up Vinny's, which was eleven years ago now. Uh, in wow. between, I owned a burger joint here in town called Manny's Burgers and, jo- uh, and Dogs, which was a real Brooklyn-esque sort of uh, uh, down and dirty burger and dog place. We had Nathan's Hot Dogs and such. Um, and I also was the owner and creator of a company called Dining Innovations, which was the city's uh, largest uh, catering uh, company for 16 years, which um, I'm no longer a part of. Wow. And then uh, just recently, July of last year, I opened up uh, another one of my 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 visions, which was Jenny Ray's Oyster House, which has been a huge success on Charlotte oh. Street, uh, where the old Ganshan Gans- station uh, used to be. Absolutely, and I uh, I haven't seen many restaurants open in Asheville as closely i mean we my wife and i had an apartment on charlotte street so we drove by all the time there might have been other restaurants that have opened as uh, i'd say uh, successfully i have no idea it just looked like every single night last summer there was a line out the door and it was in a pandemic and it was like you know there were tents and so every day i was like wow <laughs> like they are 
you know, the be- they say the best thing for a restaurant is a line, or a best thing for you know an opening is a line, because then people think, oh, there's a line. Uh, Yogi Berra said it, I think, best. No one goes there anymore. It's always so busy. Exactly. Exactly. No. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's uh, we uh, were incredibly um, blessed, and uh, you know, I think some of it had to do, you know, this. this there's a lot of pieces to it. And one of them is you know, mm-hmm. people knew me and knew my reputation. So they had a certain level of comfort that at least uh, the product and, and how I present it and, and how we treat people would be at a certain level. Once people got there, um, they really saw our commitment to incredibly uh, fresh uh, seafood. Um, mm. probably the freshest you'll find here in the mountains, uh, our commitment, uh, our commitment to doing, um, you know, uh, just honest food done really well, you know, just, you know, some of the basics, but we, we elevate them a tiny bit, but we do them really, really well. And, um, you know, people felt comfortable there. Uh, we, we were very stringent with our COVID, um, guidelines and, and, and social distancing and such. And the, the comment I got the most from people were that they, they, they really felt comfortable uh coming mm. into the restaurant and then plus by our product and my team and my culture that we developed there wow um i i mean we i'd love to hear the story of jetty rays i mean sure. in in a conversation i know that uh it's been many years of thought and perhaps preparation to to make it happen but um it seemed to all, all the all the cards were stacked against it, right? Like, it, it, as far as I'm concerned, opening a restaurant in a pandemic does not sound like the time I would want to open a restaurant. Um, yet it it seems to have done a great job uh, in its infancy. So, t- please tell us a little bit about how that all came to be, what your plan was, what the strategy was, how'd you launch? Uh, I'd love to love to hear it. Well, I think opening up Jetty Ray. Uh, for anybody would be a great example of, of persistence and of mm. um, really keeping a, 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 a calm focus on your vision. Um, it's something, you know, I, I do a lot of consulting with, with people around the country, mostly in the Southeast about branding and rebranding their visions and figuring out, you know, what it is they want to do or, or how they're going to change what they're in the middle of doing. But, you know, this was a project that was really originally uh, slated to be on the river. We had made a deal with Riverlink to buy a piece of property on the river from Riverlink that they were willing to sell us. Their board voted twice to sell us the property. They loved our concept and such. But we ran into a lot of brick walls and spent a tremendous amount of money um, creating our plans and our drawings and presenting to the city and to the city's uh, staff and teams. Um, and we were met with, unfortunately, a lot of, uh, unfortunate, I, I, use this, I guess not loosely, but haters, people that just did not want to see something like this on the river. It was a, a, a piece of the old guard of uh, Riverlink that mounted a, a very successful campaign against us um, with, unfortunately, some uh, I, 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 mistruths about what our intentions were and, 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 and how we were going to execute our concept. So mm. after about uh, two years of that process and, and being kicked to the curb and uh, by uh, planning and zoning, I had to take a step back and regroup and, and it wasn't going to deter me from, from seeing my vision come alive and, and, and see this, this what I felt uh, the restaurant concept was needed for here in Asheville. So um, it was interesting at the time, I was very close friends and, and a bit of a mentor to uh, Patrick O'Kane, who owned uh, Ganshan Station, who, which was the restaurant there before. Uh, and um, uh, was looking to downsize and to make some changes in his life. And uh, mm. so we started talking. And when, again, I got booted off the river, uh, I went to Patrick and I said, I might have a, have a way to solve your problems and mine. And uh, I've known his family for a while and such, so we were able to make a deal to where I took over the uh, the lease there and the property and did the things we did to open up Jetty Rays. Jetty Rays has been a, a concept in my head for the better part of 10 years, 15 years. I mean, I one day if uh, we're ever sitting in a room together, I'll show you I have a, a spiral book where I continually draw and write and come up with concepts and create menus and such. And this was just one of 
several that sit in there, and I'm sure the day I die, there'll still be a lot sitting in there, but uh, some do come to fruition. Um, and I wanted to I wanted to bring coastal seafood uh, to the mountains, quite frankly. And uh, you know, growing up, like I said, in Brooklyn and and and, and Long Island, New York, uh, on the water, uh, in, in both places, and especially in Long Island. And so, as a kid, I was I had my own lobster pots, and I was raking clams, and I was working in, in clam shacks and 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 small little seafood shacks on the coast and. and uh, 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 on the North Shore of Long Island, so there was this real, there was this real fond memory I had of of, of, of just coastal seafood, and I realized, and I thought about all of the people that had moved here from, and continue to move here from New York, Connecticut, New Jersey, you know, all along the coast, going down to Florida and 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 the Gulf Coast, and how Asheville has become this kind of stopping place and a place that a lot of people have chosen to leave those other places and come to. And I knew that there would be a demand for something like this. And if you can tap into somebody's um, emotions when creating a concept and not tr- not make it necessarily about you, but make it about how um, somebody's going to feel what, what that emotional feeling is when, when they enter a space and you, and you can somehow connect to some part of their lives past or present you start to build a really great relationship with your customer. So the other part of this was, is that our coastal seafood is so influenced by um, West African, Afro-Caribbean, Spanish, French, and American Indian influences. And you see that in, in, in certainly in the food in New Orleans and going up the coast uh, towards Maryland and uh, New York. I wanted to bring a sense of all that amazing culture that has been brought um, to us and has been given to us over generations um, into what we do. So all of our recipes, I can take you down to uh, almost every single recipe that we have and every item we have on the menu, and it and it ties you back into some culture or some um, some some diaspora of, of people coming to this country and what they gave us when they came here. So that was really a, a big inspiration as well for Jetty Rays is, is to really. Um, really feel the culture of what was given to us in the way of coastal seafood and, and, and do it, you know, do it well, do it honest and do it well and do it respectful for, uh, for those that came before us that, 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 that brought us these, uh, great recipes and styles of cooking and such. Well, um, how, how, how does that show up? I guess, practically in, in the space or on the menu, well, um, it, it, are, are you sourcing from like South Carolina and just driving it west? We source from uh, all along the eastern uh, seaboard. I mean, we start okay. up as 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 north as PEI Island, you know, up in Nova Scotia. Uh, the majority of our oysters we get every single day. People ask me that all the time. We go through about three thousand oysters a week, and we're getting the the best. Uh, Oysters, I believe, that are farmed anywhere in the world currently, and they're coming mostly off of the uh, coast of Massachusetts, um, a little bit north into Maine, and like I said, even as far north as Nova Scotia, uh, a little bit into Rhode Island. And uh, we use a company called Island Creek that I've had a relationship with for the last 10 years. I've known them off and on. I know the owners there pretty well, and they're great. They, they, they um, co-op with about uh, 40 to 60 different farmers of, of oysters. And, um, so they're, they're, they're the, uh, you know, they're the clearinghouse, if you will. So, you know, every single day, uh, chef, uh, Will Caesar, who's my executive chef over at uh, Jetty Rays, he calls, they have a discussion, you know, what's, you know, what's, what's the best looking oysters at the time, what's, what's being harvested. Literally, we call it one o'clock and. By three, three to five o'clock in the afternoon, those oysters are boxed up and handed to somebody at FedEx, and they're here the next day. So our oysters wow. literally were in the water yesterday. Um, same thing with our fish. We get our fish from a phenomenal gentleman. His name is uh, Captain Mark McKefka. Uh, he owns a company called Abundant Seafood. Mark is a one-man band with himself and his son and uh, maybe one or two other guys, and they go out every single day off the... Uh, off the deep trenches off of uh, Charleston, South Carolina, and they're mm-hmm. line catching 
uh, fish for us and for, for a lot of different restaurants actually in Asheville. And, um, you know, they're up here uh, at least once or twice a week and we're getting anywhere from 20 to 60 pound fish that we're butchering ourselves. And so it, 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 it's incredibly, incredibly fresh product. Uh, we also get oysters from North and South Carolina. Uh, so we'll influence as well. Um, our shrimp comes off of the uh, South Carolina coast. Um, so everything is, uh, I could tell you who touched every piece of seafood that we get into the restaurant. And that's very important wow. to me. It's important that we stay as sustainable as possible, but also know the source. Um, and that, that I think is what sets us apart from, from most people. And, um, it's kind of been my ethos as a restaurateur. Uh, since I started 21 years ago, back at the Savoy, I mean, we used to have, uh, I never forget the days when this is, you know, 19, uh, actually 2000, 2001, the farmers from the farmer's market used to stop in my parking lot with their trucks. And we used to just pick vegetables and such off their trucks or, you know, foragers would bring us mushrooms and such. And that would, that always stayed with me that, that, lo that connection to the person that's growing your food. Uh, is very important. I will have to say, because I've had this debate before, people say to me, you know, uh, is it local? Is it local? You know, or, or, you know, you're always local. Um, and that farm to table movement. To me, farm to table is world worldwide. And it's my job as a chef and a restaurateur to give you the best possible product at any one given time in front of you. So is it always bought here in, in, in you know, uh, Western North Carolina? No. If I can buy a, a the best possible mushroom from somebody in Maine, then I'm going to buy that mushroom because I owe it to my my guests to to put the best possible product in front of them. But I, I at least know who I'm buying that mushroom from. It's not just some huge conglomerate that's uh, you know farming out in the in in the uh, San Joaquin Valley in California. Heard, uh, and I think that makes a lot of sense to I me mean, when. when when thinking about so one of the, the notes that you you made and it's shown up in the podcast a couple of times, I think that there's a, a distinction between a small business owner and an entrepreneur, and I imagine there might be a difference between being a chef who owns a restaurant, a restaurant owner, and a restaurant tour. And I'm wondering, do you feel that over the years there's been a progression in how you think about your businesses? Uh, and how you think about putting a you know meal on a on a table for guests versus uh, a dining experience and calling back on a memory uh, those seem like you know potentially checkers and chess. No, absolutely. I, I, you hit it on the head. Actually, you know, I consider myself an entrepreneur to start. I mean, I started out in a completely different business and world before I came to Asheville. I've owned uh, many different businesses, um, but I chose to. Uh, really monetize my passions when I was about 32 years old, monetizing my passion of food and wine and people bringing all that together. Um, so was I always a chef? No, I became a, a self-taught chef. I, I actually did some cooking schools, but not to the extent of, you know, a four year degree at, at Wales. Um, but what I had going into all of this at first was a really great sense of business because I don't care if you're a chef, if you're just an entrepreneur, if you're all of these things put together, the restaurant business is still a business and it still has mm -hmm. to be ran and looked at. And um, uh, the principles of, of sound uh, hospitality economics have to be in place in order for you to succeed. You can have the best food in the world and you can serve the best food in the world. But, A, if you're not profitable, <laughs> that's going to suck. And, B, um, you know, if you're unable to have the funds to grow and to market yourself and to um, support those around you. And um, then it's not really worth it. So, you know, I transitioned, I was a good businessman. And then I, I, I taught myself the, the science and understanding of, of food from a, a chef's perspective and started to cook and, and was cooking for a while. And then I brought all that together in my creative backgrounds, because we'll get into some, I'm sure at some point, but my background comes out of the advertising business. But, mm -hmm. you know, I brought my sense of knowing how to, how to create brands and cultures and, and wrap those brands and cultures uh, around the, the uh, execution of, of 
our product and how that really inculcated ourselves into the live the lives and livelihoods of those people that supported us our guests they became our fans right so those people go out and they tell more people about us and hence you know you see if you drive down Merriman Avenue you'll have a two and a half hour wait sometimes to get into Vinnie's so you know it's it's there's a process uh, I you know I think I, I work with a lot of young chefs these days that that are still trying to learn the going beyond just being a chef and 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 wanting to th- you know get those creative juices going and and get these most beautiful plates out there to understand that that's only one little piece of of the story because if if you create a restaurant and it's not created around again a brand a culture and an experience it's 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 going to have a very hard uh, hill to climb heard was uh Savoy your first restaurant uh, actually, my first restaurant was a restaurant called Cafe Sushi in Los Angeles, California, back in the 80s. And it was a restaurant that I uh, convinced my dad, actually, who had just retired to uh, get involved with me and a, a friend of mine who was a superstar sushi chef back in the uh, mid 80s. And uh, so we opened up this restaurant that became an overnight success. And uh, it was interesting. We never published our phone numbers or addresses. We never we never really advertised. And the place was packed every single night. It was partially also because it was uh, it was sandwiched between the recording studios in Los Angeles, and so you know a lot of the a lot of the artists that were pretty famous, Michael Jackson, Smokey Robinson, the Commodores, people like that, used to just come in and hang out. We stayed open late, so while they were recording, uh, they could take breaks and come get sushi. We'd send sushi over to them. So no, it's not my first restaurant, but it was the first restaurant that I opened up on my own by myself. Um, wow. something that's relevant here, I think is the reason why I came to Asheville is several reasons. One is, there you go. um, uh, well, I had just met a woman who's now my wife, uh, Heidi, uh, and, uh, we met in Argentina while I was working on a job. I, I spent the first 18 years of my life in the entertainment business. My father was a very well-known and well-respected man in the advertising business and owned, uh, a, a actually the world's largest uh, TV commercial company at the time after he came out of the advertising world. So I grew up in that world. And, um, I went to California to, to pursue that, to pursue the TV commercial industry. And I started out uh, starting a little company with some friends, a little rock video company called Pendulum Productions. And that turned into a larger company. Um, and, you know, I was in my early 20s at the time. And uh, so I, I started out in rock videos. I got involved in, in rock and roll and concert tour production. I worked for Sting for a while and um, Motley Crue. And um, I, 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 I had a, a really nice stint in the music industry. And then I fell back into the TV commercial world. Um, uh, long story short, I was, I was working in different uh, countries in, in the advertising business. I was working in uh, Germany. I was working in Argentina, in Chile, in Brazil. Um, and I met my wife in Argentina, who was a, an actress and a model down there um, on, a, on a TV commercial, actually. And um, so uh, she hadn't decided to move to the United States yet. She, she decided to come to the States. And unfortunately, in the first year and a half that she was here, she got uh, mugged. Uh, I was attempted carjacked and the 94 earthquake hit. And so she looked at me and said, I'm going back to Argentina. And uh, I, you know, I was going through, uh, you know, even though I was only 30, kind of a midlife crisis in an identity crisis. I grew up my entire mm-hmm. life under the shadows of my father. And um, it was hard. It was very difficult because he was so well known. And every time I met somebody, it was like my dad's name was Manny. Manny Sheffer, hey, you're Manny's son, right? Or, you know, so I never felt like I, I, I created my own world for myself. Um, and so when I had, I think it was right before the earthquake hit, I was working for Oliver Stone and we were setting up a Vita in Argentina. Um, so I had a really good footing background in Argentina. I spent a lot of time down there. Um, uh, while that was happening, Heidi and I were trying to decide what it is we're going to do with our lives. And I came back from, uh, working with Oliver there, setting that up. He was taken off the film. So I got fired off the film at that point because they brought a new team in. But, um, I said, Hey, why don't we just 
start our lives over again. Let's, you know, you stop modeling, I'll stop, you know, what I've been doing in, in, in the entertainment world and, and go, go start a new life somewhere. And I, and it was really the impetus that, uh, that brought us here. I, I had a, a friend of mine who had just moved here himself in 1994 and uh, we were invited to come here for Thanksgiving, and we, like most people, we arrived, we got off the airplane, I rented a car, and then we got lost. <laughs> and where I come from, if you see something that says a parkway, <laughs> it usually is going to lead you somewhere, it's going to have a couple of gas stations, it's going to, right? So I saw yeah. Blue, Ridge, Blue Ridge Parkway, okay, so I'll get on that thing and figure out where I am. And that took us even <laughs> further into uh, Never Never Land, and um, sure. we ended up pulling off one of the... Uh, uh, pullouts, um, uh, you know, the, the, the scenic views. Scenic overlooks, yeah, yeah. yeah. We got out of the car and we just both stood there. And I never forget this. We stood there for like a good 10 minutes and stared. And then we both looked at each other and there was like tears welling up in both of our eyes because we knew this is where we'd spend the rest of our lives. This is where we want to wow. move. And so like literally within the first couple hours of coming to Asheville, I knew this is where I would, I wanted to be. And so uh, I was actually working on a film uh, with um, or putting together a film for uh, um, some folks. And I, I was able to get myself out of it, um, negotiate mm -hmm. my way out of it. And uh, we literally just packed up our apartment and moved to Asheville, sight unseen. Um, and we got here April 1st, 1995. I'll never forget it. So that's kind of how we got here. Wild, <laughs> wild, wild, wild. Uh it uh, this is just how my mind works. It, I, I'm amazed that there has never been a Argentinian steakhouse in your uh, restaurant groups to to connect a couple dots. It's it's there. The the, the way I kind of um, satisfied that uh, bit of me that I, I you know this I talk to people about this a lot. I really think in my past life I was a gaucho somewhere. I really I, I have this. Argentina is like my, my second home and love, and I'm very comfortable there. I mean, you can just drop me anywhere in the middle of the country, and I'm, I'm comfortable. I feel like I've been there before. Um, yeah. So about 16 years ago, I started my own winery in Argentina. Um, I had met, while owning the Savoy, I had met um, uh, a couple up and coming, uh, very young and, and becoming very famous winemakers in Argentina. And uh, one year, my wife and I traveled to Mendoza to meet them because I was serving their wines in um, the Savoy. And after a wonderful Argentinian asado and a lot of bottles of wine, uh, we decided we'd start a project together. So I came back to the United States. I raised some money. Um, and we started a small boutique uh, winery called Bodega Gratia, which I owned for 15 years, uh, sold it about a year and a half ago. Well, I closed it about a year and a half ago. Um, but that also then turned into a wine importation business. So I was importing wines from Spain and France. I was spending a lot of time in Spain and France um, making wine, uh, making wine in Argentina, creating brands, you know, sort of always going back to my, my roots of, of, of advertising and marketing. Because uh, I, because I, I, I did spend some, a lot of years working in advertising agencies. Actually, uh, I didn't tell you when I first. I owned an advertising agency. I had gotten a phone call from a friend of mine, um, and he had moved to Charleston, and he was a, a director out in Los Angeles. And uh, he said, "Hey, uh, my nickname in those days was Hollywood." He called me up. He said, "Hey, Hollywood." He said, uh, "I just moved to Charleston." He says, "I got all this work coming in from from Peru and from Argentina and from Chile." And you speak Spanish and you've worked down there. He says, could you help me with this stuff? I said, sure. And we ended up starting a company called Kingfisher Productions out of Charleston. And that was an advertising agency and a creative agency and a production company. So I did that for the first four years until about 1999 when I got here. But I was, again, spending a lot of time in Latin America. So I really had a good footing on that. And the winery was a natural extension for me. I mean, I really, uh, wow. uh, you know, I, I'm pretty well known for my wine knowledge and my wine list that I create and such and um, my wine program. So it became a natural and uh, built this, uh, built a built the imports, which was our importation company. Um, and all of that uh, has recently uh, ended because it was just time. It was getting very difficult to stay in the wine business. But, um, you know, it, 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 it all connects. So going back to what you said, uh, there is back over here a little concept of a small little 
boutique Argentinian restaurant, hopefully that I'll uh, get to open in the next couple of years here in Nashville. Huh? So I, 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 so many, uh, I guess threads that I could pull on (laughs) and, and to try and keep it, I guess, uh, together instead of uh, pull it apart when you think i guess then about your process for i'll just say the last 20 or so years uh-huh. right, the restaurant door uh-huh. experience have you thought about things in i'll call it categories or have you how have you thought about it because savoy you said fine dining and it had its run then you i, I don't know how you closed it but you closed it and then you went to what i feel is like a I don't know, Northeast uh, Italian restaurant. Like it, it feels like it's a, I'm back in New Jersey. Vinny's is a New Jersey vibe for me. Sure. Uh, uh, a New York, perhaps Long Island uh-huh. Italian restaurant. Not to me, at least not fine dining, but good food. Just good, like comfortable Italian food. Well, you know, uh, and then seafood. It, 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 it was sort of um, a little bit reactionary and a little bit, um, you know, I can say it now, brilliance, but uh, the reactionary part of it was uh, the economy crashed in 08. In 08. And uh, fine dining was heading was, was going away. You know, we were, we were a, a white mm-hmm. tablecloth, very expensive restaurant. And when everybody was starting to lose their fortunes and 401ks and so on and so forth, people stopped showing up at the Savoy. And I was losing a mm-hmm. tremendous amount of money pretty quickly. So I knew I had a pivot. And uh, what... I knew I would, one thing I knew in my gut was I needed to pivot to create something that was going to bring a sense of comfort, a sense of normalcy, a sense of warmth, a sense of, like I said to you before, evoking uh, uh, something from your past. So you have something to to really ground yourself with. And I'm sure like you and like me, you know, whether you're Jewish or Italian or whatever, there was always always a Vinny's in your neighborhood. It was Something always like it. Absolutely. It was always a little Italian joint where you walked yeah. in and everybody knew you and you greeted with big hugs and smiles. You sat down with the best bowl of, you know, linguine and clams and you had a great bottle of Chianti and, you know, you, 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 everything else that was going on in the world around you went away. That's what mm-hmm. I knew or felt inside of me that was needed here at the time in Asheville, North Carolina, going through this. And, you know, I can say this to you, but it's, it, unless you grew up and lived it, and, and, and I actually worked in an Italian restaurant for a guy by the name of Vinnie Coppola, who I named this restaurant uh, after, um, unless you've lived it, 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 it it's very hard to, to pull off. So, uh, you know, it was mm-hmm. kind of natural to me. I also realized, again, going back to something I said to you earlier with Jetty Ray's and Coastal Seafood, there's a tremendous amount of people that live here that are from the Northeast. There's a tremendous mm-hmm. amount of people here that know this food like the back of their hands. There's a tremendous amount of people that walk in here and say, my God, your eggplant Parmesan, I, you know, it, it's better than my mom's. You know, no. Kind of so, <laughs> you know, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I get it. I get it a lot, actually. Um, so, you know, it, it, I, I, I tapped into what, you know, the timing was right. You know, even though it was bad time, yeah. um, but I tapped into um, what I truly believe is, you, you, you know, emotion is good. And you have to, w- when you mm-hmm. create anything, especially a restaurant, you have to tap in, 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 into an emotional connection to your to your to your to your audience. Um, and you have to um, make them feel from the time they get out of their car to the time they leave. You have to give them an experience of comfort and 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 um, joy and uh, familiarity and family, and that's what we did with Vinny's. Great. Was Savoy in the same footprint, or did you find a new location for it? No, Savoy was in the for same me. building. Yeah, so that was okay. uh, an interesting thing, also, because we had to, and we did it within uh, two and a half months. We literally flipped this restaurant two and a half months, and went from this you know, really fine dining, white tablecloth restaurant to, you know, a little bit more, again, neighborhood family uh, uh, feel. And uh, so, no, we stayed in the same location. Great. Um, And then uh, with all of these projects that seem to have been happening um, 
if not sequentially, sometimes at the same time. H- how have you evolved as a project manager? Or because I have to imagine at certain stages you you have to remove yourself from specific tasks and and level to the the manager and and, and level above a manager to a manager of managers. Uh, what does it look like uh, to be a operator of multiple? either businesses or multiple restaurants, how do you think about the world? Well, it's very interesting. Actually, my film background comes into play here a lot because uh, becoming a, you know, when you're a producer and you're producing, whether it's a concert, you know, or, uh, or, or a TV commercial or uh, a film, which I bought, you're managing sometimes hundreds of people and you're moving all of these people, you know, maybe to different states or locations. And, you know, so it's a, it's a, it's a sort of an air traffic control sort of mentality that I've always had in my head. I've also been incredibly, incredibly detail oriented and budget driven. So taking all those things together. Yeah, I was very hands on. We, we joked that the first years of first four years of my life owning the Savoy, I was here and, and this is literal. I was here seven days a week for four years. I didn't leave. Until the point where my daughter, who's now 21, back in the day, said to me, uh, Daddy, why do you live at the restaurant? And that's when I knew I had mm-hmm. to make some, some, some real uh, changes for myself and, 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 and to better her as well. But, you know, what I started to do is you start to surround yourself with people that, A, are younger than you, that are smarter than you, that you can uh, teach your um, – methodology that to, if you will, drink your cool and understand your vision. Um, and you start to slowly give them more responsibility and you have to stay in very close communications. I mean, I'm still in my restaurants all the time. I don't work there at night much anymore. Um, I've been working over at Jetty Ray's a little bit more to, you know, eat to, 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 to help, um, uh, craft the the culture there with my staff, but you know you really have to you know I have people that have been working for me for fifteen sixteen years. I have a bartender that's been working with me, Josh, for nine years. People stay with me, <clears throat> and they stay with me because I treat them like 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 people. I treat them with respect. I treat them like my family. Um, I understand their pain. I understand their struggles. Work with their how I can help uh, them. I look at you know people around me, and I say this to them when I hire them. You know, I don't care if you're going to be with me for ten minutes or for ten years. I want you to become a better person while working for me first, and then become a better chef or a better manager or better whatever you're going to be. Because it, uh, I believe it's my job and part of my legacy to to at some point push you out of the nest if you want to, and go off to do something else. And I want you to be a better person when you do that, so you can you can you can take forward better skill sets and also a better way of of, of treating people uh, i think that, mm. that that that's that's crucial to me so again going back to your question it's surrounding yourself with with the right people and 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 giving them the opportunity to fail giving them the opportunity to fail again and fail again uh but also making sure that with their failures there's a there's a learning curve there and that they're learning mm. from their mistakes um, I really encourage. Really, uh, I've had some people make some pretty stupid mistakes and actually things that have cost me a lot of money, but I haven't fired them because it's part of the process. You know, it's, 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 mm. I had to do it too at some point in my life. So, um, but again, you know, I, I always, I always kept that my, what I try to drive all my team members back to is the fact that we're running a business here. We, we spend a lot of time with analytics and, 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 and reviewing numbers and such. So, um, but it's also my job to to step back because otherwise I I I, I couldn't I couldn't do it all well um, really well as well as I want to do it if I try to control everything and mm-hmm. admittedly so I'm a bit of a control freak and most people know that so they try to stay within the within the within the lines as they're driving down the uh, the Eric Sheffer Road uh, of you know because I have principles that I live by and they live by those principles and they live by the the um, the sound um, uh, business, um, uh, I guess, uh, just the guidelines that we set for ourselves and, and the standards we set for ourselves um, as we grow our businesses. But it's about the people. It's about who I surround myself with. I couldn't have done all this stuff myself. I mean, I, I like to take all the credit and I like to be, you know, the guy out front and the guy that, you know, 
everybody's taking photographs of and stuff like that. But it's not about me. It's about everybody else that works for me because uh, they make me look really good. I love that. What are, uh, to, to be a, a hair more practical, what are some examples of perhaps the uh, the bumpers that you set as a business owner in restaurants? Is it, you know, it seems perhaps overly simplistic to say we need to make more than we spend. Uh, but like, it, it, are there thoughts like, you know, if a plate costs 20 bucks, it's got to cost you less than 10 uh, sure. to put it on a t uh, sure. plate. Uh, if I'm building out a room, I got to recognize that back in the first 12 months. I, I, what are, what are parameters? I don't even, I couldn't even pretend to know what they would be. Well, the first parameter is, is that, um, I do believe you need to spend money to make money. So heard that, um, you know, going into the restaurant business, you better have a really nice deep pot of cash. Because mm. you're going to need to spend it. And the last thing you want to do is start to build a reputation and run out of money for marketing or for things you may need in the restaurant or a piece of equipment or the quality of food or not be able to pay your bills. So having a really solid foundation works. The other thing is, is that, like I said to you before, there's no secrets here. I mean, we literally every Monday morning we have a manager's meeting. I have a Monday is at Vinny's and Wednesday's at Jetty Ray's. And we print off P&Ls and we go line by line of everything that's been spent. Uh, mm. We try to set some goals for ourselves of what our food cost and our labor costs are going to be. For, and they're different for both restaurants. Because both restaurants have different um, uh, pushes and pulls, if you will, and have, have different requirements. Vinny's has a much bigger staff than Jetty Ray's does. So what we try to do. Is, is, is detailed planning before we even open up the doors and we, and we create models that say, okay, here's three different models that we're setting off to, to, to achieve. And once we get going and started, we start to see how the numbers and, and how the flow of business and how all, and how all that starts to change and interchange with each other and end up probably mm -hmm. from three models coming into the one that's really perfect for that particular concept. Um, it, it's, it's crucially important that we communicate. Communication is the key. Um, every single one of my managers, uh, every single one of my chefs, and I talk at least once a day. And I don't care if it's mm -hmm. a 10-minute conversation saying, hey, everything's great. You know, we got some great Beausoleil oysters in this morning. You need to come by and try them. And so-and-so uh, -so in the dish pit is really coming uh, very well. I'm going to give them a rate. Right. We talk. And, and – um, I'm not like a lot of owners that just open up a restaurant, it gets running, and they stand back. Uh, I, you know, people make fun of me, but I make what I call surprise visits. I mean, I just show up when I'm going to show up, and I start working, and I get involved, and I, you know, and I talk. Um, the other thing that's been very, very crucial, uh, and this is about communication, but it's about again, this goes back to about being with people. And I'll come back to a financial thing here in a second, but. I, mm -hmm. I started the thing many, many, many years ago, probably 15, 18 years ago, and I call it 10 Minutes with Eric. And every quarter, I make every single person that works for me, and you know, there's a lot of peoples, um, they have to sign up and they have to come and sit with me alone somewhere and spend 10 minutes with me. I want, them. I want to know about their lives. I want to know about what their struggles are. I want to know that they need tires on their car. I want to know that they're dealing with a drug or alcohol problem. I want to know that they're having mental illness breakdown. By my connection and doing that with my staff, A, I get to know about them, and I can be a better owner by supporting them. I can be a better owner by being a human being and not just be somebody that's signing their paychecks. And mm. what they do is they then they, they begin to trust me. And that trust becomes mutual and that trust grows into them. Uh, I'll use a, you know, a euphemism of, and they start understanding my, 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 my vision and drinking my Kool-Aid and they really want to be there for me. I mean, when my mm -hmm. staff comes into work, they know they're working for me, my family and themselves to create greatness every single night, to create a space that, that is, that is second to none. So by doing all of that and connecting myself to people, I get them to really want to be more than just a waitron or a server. They really want to be part of the success of a restaurant. Um, and I pay people very well. I'm probably one of the only restaurateurs you'll ever meet that bonuses every single person in their restaurants every single year. And I mean from the 
dishwashers on up to the top managers. We, we have this little celebratory, usually a Friday before Christmas, and people come in with their families, and I, and I hand out gifts and, and money, and um, I truly believe in that. I mean, I, I, I believe you have to give to give, not give to get. So the, 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 one of the other driving forces of my life and, and ethos of my life is giving back to our community. You know, it's a big part of my businesses, too. I mean, people know me here uh, starting back in the Savoy and through all of the uh, different concepts that I've, I, I've been involved with that I give back a tremendous to my community. That's one of the, you know, I'm going to go back to something for something, uh, for something for a second. I couldn't do that in Los Angeles. I couldn't be who I am today in Asheville and L.A. because I'd, I'd, I'd be lost in the sauce. You know, I'd be I'd be one of just millions i was able to come here and establish myself and create a healthy business and get involved with the jcc and be on their board or uh, you know i was the i was on the tda for seven years and their chairman for a year and a half and you know i have been on a lot of boards and, and and i've done fundraisers and and and, and helped wincap and all these different organizations i couldn't have done that in los angeles i would have been less a little, little tiny p in this you know big mm. bowl of soup but getting back to what your question was um you know, it's really about um, not sticking your head in the sand every single day, looking at your numbers, really having a plan before you even open up the door and maybe three different plans. And you look at those plans and you work them um, and and really being detailed with your numbers. I mean, it's it's crucial. And I'm going to tell you, I mean, I've been consulting with people now for the past 10 years. The one thing that most people don't understand is the economics of hospitality, and it's different than any other business. It's so different. So, you know, you've got food costs, you've got labor costs, you've got, you know, uh, your dry goods, you've got paper goods, you've got overhead. And, and all of these things are, are constantly moving, constantly moving. So it's finding a way to have checks and balances and, and to be able to catch the mistakes, because what ends up happening is a lot of restaurateurs. You know, they, 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 they keep their head down and they work for three or four months and they pick up their heads and they go, oh, my God, what happened over here? Why didn't I see that over there? And if you're not constantly in it every single day, it's um, it's a real recipe for uh, disaster. Wow. I know. I'm um, alluded, sorry. <laughs> no, that was that, that was a lot. And I think uh, you you touched something that I uh, I'm only ever been loosely loosely adjacent to but uh alcohol abuse drug abuse in restaurants seems like disproportionately sure. high and and you you touched on it i'm wondering oh, yeah. uh with with staff with being a restaurateur for as long as you have um you know how how do you take care of your people when when you uncover things like that um i know i've i've just been adjacent i know there are some communities i i was at a um I want to say Asheville Air event where that that was like a huge part of it. It was almost, oh, over a year ago at this point, uh-huh. um, and they talked about some community or another that is, uh, you know, just supports restaurant staff and and helps keep people clean. I'm wondering uh, any lessons, hard earned, hard learned, sure. in in that respect. You know, one of the things I've learned is again. Um, every single one of the people that have worked for me over the last 21 years are people and they are different and they all have their different struggles and they all come with their own journeys and stories. And, um, yes, the restaurant business, uh, has lent itself to becoming a, you know, den of iniquities with, you know, late nights and alcohol and then, you know, the introduction of drugs, uh, which is, yeah. you know, um, what I find is this. I find uh, that most people, not all, um, don't want that for themselves um, and find themselves uh, somehow um, caught in it um, and mm. or wrapped up in it for whatever the reasons may be. Um, but most of them want out and most of them want a way to get out and find a pathway towards recovery, if you will, uh, sobriety or, uh, you know, understanding their emotions better or, or feel, you know, working on the pain that they're trying to, uh, to numb with their drugs and alcohol. And that's where staying in touch with your, with your team and, and everybody that works for you. I mean, I go into the dish pit and I'll hang out with the dishwashers and talk to them and, 
um, all the way up to my chef. So, you know, it's staying connected, but understanding that um, a lot of it is is um, incredibly sexy. You know, you become a chef and you're working and all of a sudden the yeah. guys go out at night and they go to, you know, the bars and they start doing coke and they start drinking. It's very sexy and you get caught up in this. But if you can give people a sense of that, that's not what normalcy is. I mean, we have a very strong uh, um, no drug and alcohol policy here uh, in all my restaurants. And people know that when they come to start working with me. Um, and I make it very clear that if you do have a drug and alcohol problem, we will help you. Well, you know, I pay mm. for people to go into rehab. We, we pay for people uh, to, um, you know, I, I pay, I, I used to do this thing where I, I buy people uh, patches to stop smoking cigarettes, you know. So, you know, it, 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 it's again, it's connecting yeah. to people on a, on a human level um, because it, 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 unfortunately, um, uh, it, it can get very out of hand and very rampant and it will destroy your business. I could tell you that, that, yeah. that if you let that happen, um, and, and I, I, I experienced it over the last 21 years at different, different times. I, I'm happy to say Knockwood probably not over the last 10 or 11 years, but, um, yeah. you have to pay attention and that's what happens. A lot of restaurateurs don't pay attention. They see their restaurants start to make money. They, you know, they have a couple of people they think they trust and mm -hmm. then they don't show up. You know, and they're not there. I mean, people know I'm here all the time, so they're not going to get away with shit. And I've had my mm -hmm. own, you know, my own journey with drugs and alcohol when I was in Los Angeles. Also, one of the other reasons why I chose to get out of that hellhole. I have to imagine. And I, I it didn't want to, you know, guess at anything. But it, you read a book like Kitchen Confidential, right? And it just, it sounds, the word you used was sexy. And I think that's fair. Uh, you know, the way that he talks about the, the kitchens in the 90s and I imagine 80s as well and uh, early 2000s. I mean, you're you're growing up uh, in kitchens and I imagine you look up to the chef and you do whatever whatever you sure. do. But your question is very perceptive and, you know, it's it's drugs and alcohol um, have destroyed many, many great chef, uh, mm -hmm. have brought down many a great restaurant. And I'm acutely aware of it. I mean, I had my own drug and alcohol, as I said, struggles back in Los Angeles. I, I, I regret every moment of it. Um, mm. You know, it was part of, it was, you know, like you said, you know, mm. you're hanging out with famous people and directors and all this stuff. And it comes kind of with the, with the territory. Um, and so I understand it. I get it. Um, yeah. and, and that's why I have you know, compassion when I see people struggle with it. And, you know, there are certain people that are just destined to be, you know, drug addicts and alcoholics, and that's going to be their path. But I think most people want to find a way out. They want to find a way yeah. uh, to sobriety and, or into, um, you know, uh, a, a clean world. I, I think that's fair. And um, w one of the other things I'm thinking about is the 20 plus years of living in Asheville and seeing this city grow and evolve. Um, you, you've mentioned some of the, the charity or community building work that you've done. Um, I, I'm going to ask a question that is perhaps, you know, departs a little bit from restaurants and the core business um, mind that you have. But when you think about Asheville and the community here and its growth and its changes, what, what comes up for you? Hmm. That's fascinating. It's a great question. Um, I may get myself into trouble here. Um, I think we have one of the most, we live in and, and, um, I can say for the last 27 years I've been here, or 26 years I've been here, I've been a part of helping grow one of the most magical places on the earth. Um, I, I've traveled all around the world. I've lived in places and nothing ever has compared to when I get on a plane to come home to Asheville. Uh, I, I think we've been less than thoughtful and I think very misguided in the, in, in, in the planning of Asheville in many ways. Mm. Um, sure, it's great to have all these tourists, and I want tourists. And it's, sure, it's great to have this growth. I want growth. Sure, it's great to create this amazing food scene, which I've been blessed to be a big part of. But if you don't have leadership up, up, up at the top, i.e. the mayor and city council and, and county commissioners that have a real cl clear vision of what Asheville should be. You know, I, I, I've been here for, like I said, 26 years. I, I was on the six of the six of those, I think. 
And it was like every three years we were doing a new planning session. Every three years there was some other idea. You know, every three years we were deciding who was going to be able to build a hotel and not build a hotel. There was never a clear cut plan. There was never a really thought out, here's the direction of Asheville for the next 25 years and here's how we're going to grow and here's how we're going to respect our mountains. We're going to, we're going to uh, allow people you know, to be entrepreneurs and to build and to, and, and to create their dreams. Here's how we're going to handle tourism. Here's how we're going to, you know, successfully, you know, allow people to invest in Asheville um, and not turn them away and not, you know, I, and, and it happened to me, you know, not spend, you know, I spent close to $75,000 developing the project down on, on the river and to be told no. Right. So, mm. you know, I, 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 Asheville, despite itself, has has grown, um, but I think it's still a little bit disjointed, you know. And I, I I wish we would finally just settle on a set of rules and guidelines that make sense for everybody, because you know this is not just a place. One of the reasons why I moved here is because it's not just a place for people on the left or people on the right or people in the middle. It's a place for all of us to actually come together and exist together and understand each other and embrace each other. And sometimes I just find that people's own self-interests get in the way of, of, of really creating or, 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 or helping create uh, a, a better pathway and vision for Asheville. Mm. I, uh, I hear you on the, this might get me in trouble. I, I, when I think about the growth of Asheville, um, that we've experienced just in the less than two years that we've been here, um, and the, the complexity of, uh, of attempting to take what I'll call this a big town, mm-hmm. right? Like I, I have a hard time calling Asheville a city cause I've been in cities, right? Like the fact that we get talked about in the same breath in the same sentences as proper million people cities mm-hmm. hundreds of thousands of person cities is a testament to the brand that is Asheville um but i i i the complexity of attempting to say here's what this city's future is going to look like um for 20 years which is part of the we you know you ask a bricklayer what is he doing and i'm laying a brick you ask, uh, you ask the same person, you know, in the next row, what are you doing? I'm building a cathedral, and I don't know if there's a cathedral vision right. to your point that says like this is where we're headed. Everyone get on board, um, and if there's even enough uh, avenues for 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 dialogue, I am trying to get smarter and trying to get more uh, aware of all of the, I'll say pieces that are uh, even at play and on this chessboard that is city planning and development and trying to do, do right by our community members. But what a complex task. Holy moly. When you, um, when you, when you figure it out, let me know. Yeah. Heard. Yeah. We'll, we'll circle back. Yeah. Because you know, it, 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 look, you can't, uh, Ash, Asheville, Ash, there's just this natural process of growth that's going to happen, right? I mean, and yeah. it can be done respecting everybody's sort of little pieces. Not everybody's going to win and not everybody's going to get what they want. But if you, if, if you really dig down into it with, with open minds and hearts, um, you can create a plan that kind of helps us grow in a way that's respectful to all that, that are involved. And, um, mm. you know, w- w- it's interesting you said this because at the CVB level, you know, Marla Tamberlini and her team have done an amazing job of selling Asheville and really, like you said, putting us on the map and, and, and creating this incredible story about us. And I was involved with her when we created the Futopian Society uh, mm. when I was on the board. And, you know, we said we were going to be a food town. We were, we were going to put the, you know, the stakes in the ground, and it worked. Um, you know, so I know that when people get together and share really good ideas and work together for something, it works. You know, people say to me, oh, you know, uh, Asheville's a foodtopian society, you know, and all these people are coming here from elsewhere to open up restaurants. Do you, you know, how do you feel about that? I love it. 
as long as they play by the rules, as long as all respectful to each other. You know, I'm, I, I, you know, people say to me, oh, that new restaurant opened up, you know, are you worried? No, because I don't look at other restaurants as competition ever. That goes back to my business mentality. Never, ever, ever look at the guy who just opened up a restaurant across the street from you as, as, as competition. Because we're all in the same pool together. You're actually here to help each other. That's why I started with uh, Michelle Baudouin uh, from uh, Rendezvous and Bouchon, the Asheville Independent Restaurant Association, I think, 15, 16 years ago. That was our purpose, was to bring us all together because we need each other. Um, and there's plenty of business to go around. It's been proven, you know, that you know, from tourists to locals. And I always say, look, the best will rise to the top. The ones that shouldn't be doing this are going to go out of business, you know, because people put their life savings into it. And it kind of, you know, it kind of figures itself out as it goes. Um, mm. But it's about planning. I mean, we had some really good plans when when we first started the Asheville Independent Restaurant Association. When we worked together, we created events together, we marketed together. And it just, it, it bred this really wonderful spirit of, you know, and not not all of us thought the same. And, you know, I wasn't here to tell somebody else how to run their restaurant or them to tell me how to run their uh, my restaurant. But we created an atmosphere for all of us to operate in that protected us and was was um, respectful to our investments and what we were, you know, we were putting our life savings. We all have put our life savings, most of us, mm. into what we do today. Wow. I uh, I hear that. And I, I, I think that air for what little I've... Uh been exposed to it seems to be a very powerful very meaningful uh, connective tissue between all of the small restaurateurs in in town um i'm gonna pivot because i don't sure. necessarily know how much further to go down that that thread but uh you mentioned uh early days of either savoy or vinnie's where your daughter said you're why do you live at the restaurant how has your life outside of the restaurants evolved, changed, grown, where are you at uh, now versus when you moved here uh, in the mid-90s? Excellent question. Um, I realized, you know, again, to be a little bit cliche -ish, I realized I needed to find a work-life balance. Um, I realized that um, I wasn't going to take on projects that weren't going to be really fulfilling to me and bring me joy uh, in their execution and, and working on them. I realized that there were people in my life in my, in my life and over my life uh, that I needed to expunge that weren't bringing, um, you know, positive, joyous uh times to me on a business level and a person's personal level. Um, I focused more on my daughter. Uh, my daughter happens to be blind and, um, uh, she, she struggles, uh, every single day, uh, living in that world, but she's a, a fighter and, um, an amazing inspiration for me. Um, mm. so I, I, I worked as closely as I could or stayed as close as I could uh, helping her through her struggles. My wife's really been the one that's uh, on a daily basis helped her. But, you know, I, I realized she needed me more as a dad. Um, I, uh, you know, I started taking more time for myself. I, I started, uh, you know, spending, instead of working seven days a week, I cut it down to six days a week. And, you know, uh, uh, it's funny because it's, it's hard for me on Saturday not to stop by somewhere. I, I really made some changes that way. I, when I was in Los Angeles, I used to meditate all the time. I was very spiritual. I've gotten back to my spirituality. I brought that all back into my mm. life. I meditate more now. I try to, um, to, to just find the really positive things in life and not get caught up in, 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 in the quote unquote, excuse my French bullshit that a lot mm. of, you know, a lot of times you can go down those rabbit holes. I mean, I, I got rid of Facebook in my life. I got rid of, you know, all of that social media stuff. I, um, I, uh, from that point forward, and this is, you know, 15 years ago, I, I just, I just, I, I, I went down a journey of making sure that every single day, um, the most important thing at the end of the day was finding joy. You know, it didn't matter the stuff. It didn't matter the money. It didn't matter the, even the relationships. It, it mattered 
how happy I was at the end of the day when I was sitting on the end of my bed before going to be going to sleep. You know, how did I honestly feel as a human being? Did I go, do good things today? Did I help somebody today? Was I able to give something more of myself today than I did yesterday? Did I help somebody less fortunate than I did? And it really started changing my thinking uh, when I got a chance to step back and not be here seven days a week, you know, and, and, mm. and really connect more with a myself and uh, my community. And, um, you know, it's, it, it's, it's still a, a work in progress. You know, uh, I, uh, one of my dearest friends out in Los Angeles, who's a very famous um, producer once said to me, Sheffer, if, uh, if I outlive you and I get to be there and you at your eulogy, I'm going to start off by saying that Eric Sheffer, he died exhausted. And that's what I, you know, that, that, that's kind of how I live my life, but you have to balance it and you have to make sure that I do want to die exhausted, but I also want to die a happy man. I want to die a man mm. that's filled with joy and happiness and wonderful. Places. You know, we, um, before COVID, I would make it a, a plan to spend at least two months traveling. So we go to Europe, you know, I have a lot of obviously friends I made in the wine business in France and Spain and. Uh, so we'd go there or we'd go to Argentina, you know, so I, I, I definitely was very conscious of making sure I took a break and I, and I gave myself time away from here, but that also goes back to the people I trust. I know that right now I couldn't walk away from my restaurant if I had to and take a month off. And I have people here that would lay themselves down for me, um, and make sure this place uh, continues to be as successful as it is. Um, so, you know, it, it's taken time, you know, so you know, that was, like I said, about 15 years ago when all that took place, but, it, but I, mm. I've got, you know, I'm, I'm getting there. I'm, I'm getting there, which is, which is nice. Yeah. That's a, that's a special thing. Yeah. It, it it's one thing to, to, to be worn out. It's another thing to be like frayed out yeah. and, uh, just absolutely, uh, exhausted versus thoroughly, uh, used up at the end of the day <laughs> exactly. and, and able to, you know, uh, revisit it all again the, the next day. But, you know, and, and also I'll add to that because uh, people, I think, use this word loosely, uh, the word legacy. Um, mm. You know, I, I do want to leave a legacy. I want my daughter to be proud of me and, and you know, everybody that's worked for me. And I've had hundreds of people over the years work for me. There's a there's a, this wonderful handful uh, that have gone off to be restaurateurs, to be chefs, to that I've trained and, and, and have taken their skills. There's nothing more rewarding uh, for me than that. And um, it, it's kind of what I feel is my responsibility to life in general. Um, uh, you know, I'll give you an example. A uh, young gentleman who I respect so much, Brian Canapelli, owner of Pacina 24, mm. you know, knocking on my door when I had the Savoy. He'd just come out of college. He was this fresh young kid and you know, everybody wanted to work at Savoy at the time. And I believe I turned him down a couple of times and he was persistent. He came back and worked his way up to becoming my chef and was my chef for about two and a half, three years. And now look at him. He's got his own restaurant and I'm very proud of him and um, we're still very close. And, uh, you know, that's that's what I want for my life. That's, you know, I, I want to see that um, for others, quite frankly. It's amazing. Yeah, I didn't uh, realize there was a connection there. Two very different italian uh very much so. takes yeah very much so now he's he, yeah. he's he's one of the most talented people uh i've i've ever come across in my in my uh career as being a culinarian yeah um my my wife sarah lived in italy for for five years and is this uh home cook that I, i'll i say she can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with most any home cook <laughs> in the game and her sweet spot is italian food and so we kind of we'll, we'll break the the world down by um if we're doing italian is it going to be like a vinnie's italian or is it going to be like a uh cucina 24 italian because they're both they they just scratch different itches well, in terms of like uh there's there's no um what's the right word i'm not trying to hide anything here i mean what i do is italian american food sure because what yeah. he does is italian food. is <laughs> exactly. italian food yeah and it and it's it's uh it, it is missed by some palettes or, or vocabularies right? you don't have the words to say that but i uh i love that 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 there that at some point the the stories were you know in lockstep with the two of you that that what a small town yeah. what a small town it makes my heart smile um 
I had another question that I was I was thinking about with you in um in the pr- progression of your role as um a restaurateur entrepreneur uh, have there been any mottos have there been any um that that would be a simple version of a thing that you turn back to and and fall on for guidance have there been books have there been people have there been resources that you've leaned on or uh, returned to more frequently than others over the years well i i the, the example is uh the little engine that could i think i can i think i can yeah. would be absolutely fine if you, <laughs> if that's what you used no, you know it's interesting um I'm not an, uh, how can I say this to you? I'm not, uh, certain, certain of us are, are, are meant for, uh, books in college and certain of us are not kind of grew up in the streets. I'm the street guy. Uh, I barely graduated high school. I mean, literally, uh, my dad had to pull some strings to get me to graduate. Um, I, I, most of what I've learned, I've learned by doing two different things. One is paying attention to every single thing around me in detail mm-hmm. and asking a tremendous amount of questions um, and, and asking those questions with humility and humbleness and, 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 and a real willingness to learn. Um, the other thing is, is that, you know, I just truly believe that um, we're given an amazing gift every single day, and that's the gift mm-hmm. to start over. So I don't care how bad you fucked up the day before. I don't care the mistakes you've made. I don't care who you may have hurt. You have a new opportunity the next day you get up to be a better person, to try harder, to make amends, mm. to, to to really take a moment perspective and say, how could I be better today than I was yesterday? Um, so that guiding spirit for me uh, kept my chin up. Was able, you know, I was able to every single day walk in, I'd say, you know, 90% of the time with a big ass smile on my face and say, okay, let's go to work. Let's figure out how to make this even better than we did yesterday. The mistakes mm-hmm. of yesterday were mistakes. We don't own them. They're history. Leave them behind us. Keep moving forward. That I think mm-hmm. is incredibly, incredibly important. Um, my daughter always gives me crap because uh, I could get upset with her about something and about six minutes later, it's gone for me. I don't really care anymore. And she goes, how do you do that? How do you just change your attitude like that? Why aren't you still mad at me? And it's just, it's, it's not worth it. You know, it's just not worth it to yeah. hold on to that shit. So, you know, one of the things that I've learned to do is leave crap looking forward to all, because because we're given gifts every single day. They're all right in front of us. The, 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 the opportunities and the tools and the gifts are right there in front of us. Be present. That's the thing mm-hmm. I've learned. Be present. Be in the moment. Be be there for the people that are talking to you. Actually sit and think and look around and 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 and. And, and, and understand that, you know, uh, I'm not trying to think 10 moves ahead always. Mm. Sometimes I do, but not always. And I'm not ever concerned about what happened behind me other than the, uh, the, 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 the education I can get from the source. Uh, not from the source, from, mm. the, um, from the mistake I, I, I may have made. But be here right mm. now. Be very present for your staff, for yourself, for your family, um, for your friends. Be the most genuine person you can be because that will allow you to be successful in whatever you, you, you do, I truly believe. There is one book that I've used as a um, – there's two, there's two things that have inspired me. One book that was written by a gentleman who I, I really, really, really respect in the restaurant business. His name is Danny Myers. He wrote a book called Setting the Table. Mm. I suggest everybody, mm. in the, in the, everybody. should read it. Um, and there's a chef, his name is Pierre Tim. Uh, he's a mm-hmm. Senegalese chef. Um, and he, he, um, I heard him on, uh, Lynn Rosetta Casper's show. Um, uh, um, what was it called? Uh, on NPR, it's still on, but she's no longer there called, uh, we'll find it. Yeah. Lynn Rosetta Casper. Casper. Yeah. Uh, she Casper. had a show every noon, every single day on NPR. Um, and the splendid table, that's what it's called. And, mm-hmm. um, I never forget. I heard this interview that she had with him many, many, many years ago, and it changed my life regarding hospitality. And, uh, mm-hmm. he started to talk about a thing called Taranga, which is a, 
concept. It's just a wedding in the Senegalese world and, and life. And, 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 and it's the way the Senegalese people live. And it's about hospitality. It's about uh, it's about treating others the way you want to be treated. It's about bringing people mm. into your home. It's about sitting around the bowl, as he would say, and and communing with people you know and don't know, family or friends. And and it's that moment where you get to bring people into your home and and give of yourself and 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 bring to them joy and comfort and sustenance. Um, is is such a magical point uh, uh, in, 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 in time. Um, and, and, and it's a way, again, the Senegalese people are so loving and so welcoming. Um, it changed my view of hospitality dramatically. Hmm. And that's the way I think of it every single day. When we open up our doors, I'm inviting people into my home. I'm inviting people to sit around my bowl. I'm, 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 I'm figuratively and literally at times wrapping my arms around people and saying, come, be in comfort. Let me be of service to you. Let me give you the two most important things that that life can that we need in life, which is food and drink, in such a way that you feel like you're the most special person at any one given time in the moment, and and mm-hmm. treat people like that. Um, that really was a huge uh, turning point in my life uh, when I, I heard his uh, his podcast actually on that show on on NPR, and um, it's how I live my life, and it's how we we fashion everything we do um, here in the restaurants and 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 as culinarians, uh, it's what I try to teach all the people that work for me um, is that sense of taranga. Wow. Well, I. Uh, that's buttoned up, I think, wonderfully. When thinking about Taranga and 2021, what what thoughts? I mean, I, I think we learned in 2020 that uh, plans are about as useful as the process of building the plan. Um, and then, you know, the real world happens. But for 2021, what things are you uh, looking forward to? What are you, what are you thinking about? How are you going to live into Taranga in your restaurants? Taranga will always stay as the core, but what I'm looking for is normalcy. <laughs> mm. um, you know, I'm looking for people coming into the restaurants in full capacity. I'm looking for um, people um, hopefully one day dropping the mask so I, I can see people's faces and smiles again. I'm, I'm hoping for, um, you know, it, 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 it's, it, it's, it's, for me, been one of the most heartbreaking um, experiences over the last year, watching so many culinarians and restaurateurs have to shut their restaurants and some of the greatest restaurants in the world. I mean, it's like every single day you just get kicked in the head watching this happen. Um, but I hope to be part of continued uh, voice and continued energy of uh, chefs, entrepreneurs, restaurateurs that are here for people, you know, that I still have a place you can come and you can, you, you can in, in enjoy the, you know, I don't think people realized how important restaurants really were until mm. they got turned off. Um, and so I want to be at the forefront of this wave of reopening of this wave of, of, of a new birth of, of, of people being able to go back out and, and, and live their lives again and enjoy communing in restaurants. So I'm very much looking forward to that. I, I'm in the middle of building a brand new restaurant in town. Vinny South is coming out of the ground and will be opening in June. And, you know, a lot of people think as crazy as I was to open up Jetty Rays, I'm even more crazy to be doing this. And I don't think so. You know, this two, wow. this, this too shall pass and I want to be there. And uh, I think there's amazing, you know, from both a personal and business, there's, there's both personal and business opportunities ahead of me. And I'm going to continue taking advantage of them. I'm 61 years old. I'm, I think I'm still very young. I, I, I've got a lot of energy still in me. And I want to, you know, I want to be the guy out in front. I want to be, I want to be, you know, leading the charge and going into it without fear and realizing that, you know, failure is not an option and, and, and we have every opportunity to be, to be, to be great at what we do, um, in, in, in the landscape of 2021 and 22 and 22 and 23 and 24 and 25. Yeah. Wow. Where, uh, Vinnie South, where, uh, where we acquired the uh, property where the old Iannucci's the Italian restaurant used to be right before a long road. 
Uh, we're, we're, we took an old Italian restaurant and we're turning it into a old new Italian restaurant. Um, so there'll be that. Also, I'm uh, launching a brand new catering company this year called Cielo, which will be uh, an elevated, uh, a little more higher end catering company doing some very, very unique things that people haven't seen here, seen here in Nashville before. Uh, bringing my skills of, you know, I'm a master, uh, what they call asador, which is, you know, an Argentinian uh, chef who cooks over fire. Uh, mm. Be uh, bringing, you know, um, just a lot of different types of cultures and food events uh, to Asheville. Um, and I'm launching finally uh, the culmination of 21 years of my life, the Chef Group, uh, which is a, a company that I'm bringing a lot of the folks that have been around me in management and raising them up a little bit. Um, and we're going to be a company that helps um, support other restaurants and we're there to consult and help uh, people brand and rebrand and really understand the economics of hospitality, um, the economics of, 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 of growing a business health, you know, really being healthy and growing a business. And also, um, HR and, and, and how to treat people and, and how to how to retain um, talent and, and how to develop talent and, and, and how to um, really be respectful for, for the people that, that, that put their lives on the line every single day for you. So um, that's a very exciting thing for me because it's, it's sort of, like I said, the culmination of 21 years of experience uh, all coming together. And that's actually launching next month. <laughs> Your 2021 is poised to be a very big <laughs> year. Holy moly, my goodness! Uh, I, I I look forward to uh, to following along and watching as uh, each of those come to pass and 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 become real from ideas and in, into reality. Um, really, really exciting! Wow, what I. I I, I now I want to go into this whole new uh, line of questions on the future, but we're we're at about that witching hour. Okay. Um, if if our audience wanted to uh, check in, follow along, and connect with you, where are the best places for for them to to find you online? You know, the, the best things to do is follow uh, Jenny Ray's and Vinny's on Instagram. Um, and Twitter, probably that you know, you you find out most about us through that. Uh, there will become a new voice coming out uh, with the Sheffer Group, and so we'll have our own mm -hmm. Instagram page and uh, and some Twitter going on with that. Um, you know, uh, that's the best ways to follow us right now. Uh, we 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 have a I have an amazing amazing uh, social media team. Um, you know, and again, it it just pulls me back into some of that average marketing and you know how do you communicate um ha how do you connect with a guest um you know i uh, i get i get every single day you know hundreds of opportunities to touch somebody and if that mm. touch point is, is is done correctly you've made a friend for life and so that's how i look at it we just find the touch points you know, whether it is you walk in our restaurant or you see us on Instagram, um, obviously walking in the restaurant is the best place for us to touch people. Um, but, you know, the 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 absolute honor that I have um, just just to uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> just to continue being of service um, hmm. is 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 like a dream, a real dream. Thank you so much for your time today. <laughs> Thank you. I really appreciate it. Wow.